God is faithful, my Father. shelter, our fortress, our refuge. Father, we give you glory. 
you are worthy to be worshipped. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, are you blessed? And are you happy? Are you growing roots into the word of God? Are you sure? Yes, because only the word serves. Nothing else serves other than the word of God. Only the word. Yesterday we heard about the destitute. You know that homeless destitute who is powerless but a con man. What he can do is to deceive. All he can do is to deceive. Many of those that we find sinning is all about them having been deceived into walking in the path of wickedness in the counsel of the wicked. Many of those that you find walking in the way of the world would have succumbed to the deception of Satan. Many are deceived, yet others come to their senses. They realize the folly of walking in the way of the world. And therefore, they repent and find their way back in the way of the Lord. But others, they find themselves allowing Satan to manipulate them by his deceitful schemes. As a result, their hearts are hardened by sin's deceitful nature. Those are the ones that you find living a sinful life. To everyone, when you commit sin, you will be told in your conscience that this is not right. Yet others often do not listen to that small, still voice. Everyone is warned because God loves everyone. Yet many find themselves walking in that path of destruction all because they would want what to them appears to be freedom, yet it is captivity to walk in the broad path which goes through the wider gate. They feel that they are being constrained when they are told to go through the narrow gate. They feel that they are being deprived of many good things that the world may offer. They would want to enjoy what they term freedom. Yet even Paul himself said, though I may be free to do everything, yet not everything is profitable unto me. Many of God's children, they find it much easier to walk in the 
broad highway of what the term life. All because of the love of the world. Their choices are all to do with worldly desires to gratify the cravings of the flesh. Yet we are told that he who loves the world, the love for God is not in them. Anyone who loves the world, the love of God is not in them. Yet when you look to men's choices, they are all to do with worldly things to satisfy their evil desires. For any desire that is founded upon worldly things is evil. Any desire that is anchored on worldly things is evil in the sight of God. That's why, David, a man after God's heart, in Psalm 73, he says, God does good to Israel and to all those who are pure in heart. Yet he says, I almost slipped from my secure position. I almost lost my foothold. For he says, I envied the people of the world. All they have, their possessions, I envied them, he says. Those who are arrogant, who boast in their wealth in this world. For he says, I looked to their lives and I saw that they had no trouble at all. They have no burdens that they carry. They are in good health. They have amassed wealth. They have got every good possession that you may ever imagine. They live a carefree life, amassing wealth. They have no struggles in their lives. Say they have no struggles at all. They don't struggle in this world. When you look to what they have, you admire. You wish, eh, if only it would be your life. This is what David said. He says, when he looked to the wicked of this world, he saw them without any struggle. They've got every good thing that you can ever imagine. Everything. Then when he looked to himself, he saw himself struggling, lacking in food, and everything else. For many are found going astray purely because of desires that are founded upon worldly things. They are led astray because of Satan's baits that he throws all around for all to see. For everyone to see. David could not understand why that could be so. When he was one who praised God, who worshipped God, yet he found himself struggling says, I could not understand this until 
I came into the sanctuary. There I was given revelation. Then I saw their end. He saw the end of the wicked. He looked to heaven and he saw that he had no one else other than God in heaven. And on earth, he said, I would have no other good thing that I desire other than the Lord my God. He desired nothing in this earth other than to desire God. His desire was to know God. To know God. For when he looked around, he saw the wicked prospering. He could not understand of his own wisdom until he came into the presence of God. That's when he saw that God has set the wicked on a slippery path where they are destined to fall. For anyone whose desire is anchored on worldly things, their destiny is destruction. For they have their stomach as their gods. And their glory is in their shame. And their destiny is in destruction. Why? Because they have set, they have set their minds and their hearts on earthly things. And therefore, they are destined for destruction. But not so for those whose desire is to know God, whose focus is on God. You know, Philippians 3, if you read it from verse 18. For when you know that God is God, you will not struggle. You will not struggle with life. You won't struggle. It's Philippians there. Eh? You will not struggle if your focus is right. You will not struggle at all. You won't struggle with life. You will not be found as one who is easily deceived by, by the foolish one, that hopeless destitute. You know, he is a hopeless destitute, for in him there is no hope at all. In that foolish one, there is no hope at all. Yet, he is found to be leading many astray. He is found to be leading many astray. Those whose focus is on the world. All because they feel they are enjoying freedom to enter through the wider gate, which leads to destruction. That's why many, when rebuked in righteousness, they will find it very difficult to accept such rebuke. But when they are rebuked in the worldly sense, they gladly accept it. Particularly when such rebuke has got a threat of punishment. No punishment? When they are rebuked, in the realm of the law, 
they accept it. When they are rebuked in the realm of love, they don't accept. All because they would want to walk in the broad highway of destruction, not the narrow highway of life. Many. When you ask them, who do you love? They'll tell you, I love God. They love God in order for them to receive the world. And therefore, the God that they are seeking is the prince of this world, not the living God. For who, when you love God, for what he has, it is not the living God that you love, but it is the foolish one that you love. For those who are to love God, the only living God, God Almighty, the God of heaven and earth, they will never love anything ahead of God. But those who love the world, unbeknown to them, they love the foolish man that destitutes. For when you love anything of the world, you inadvertently are loving the foolish man destitute, the deceiver. It is so difficult to extricate many from the world where they've developed such deep roots. They are rooted and grounded in the world. As a result, it is very difficult to remove them from there. Their choices, often it's all about, if I'm allowed to do everything, allowed to drink, allowed to do whatever I want, and to, to make up for what God left out when he created me, I'm fine. They fill the churches. Why? Because they despise God. They despise who? God. If today we were, by the grace of God, rebuke Makeup, you'll find that eh, one will say, eh, I will never go there. I will never what? go there. They will choose the way of destruction purely because they love the world more than they love the world. If we look around ourselves here, many were, they almost slipped from that secure position all because of love of outward appearance. <laughs> they almost, they almost If you look around you, you will know some of those who almost fell all because of what it is that they desired the most. Yes, indeed, Jesus Christ, he came for the rising and falling of many. 
For it is all about choices. It is all about choices. Many have been led into the wrong path that leads them to sin unknowingly, unknowingly, all because they love the world more than the word. If we say here, let us come in those stilettos, put cement here, nice, nice tiles, and put on suits, put on, uh, you, know, you know, sitting positions which are categorized according to your suit and the deep top pocket that you have, you will have some platinum, somewhat gold, and some silver. And you say those who are to sit on platinum are those who are known to be funders with deep pockets. Many of us here will not find anywhere to sit. For when you put the world ahead, all those who are of the world will come. When you put the world ahead of God, all those who are of the world will come. They will rush. For then they will find a platform for their status to be enhanced. For wherever they go, they want to be seen. Have you seen me? Have you seen me? Have you seen the hairstyle that I'm putting on? Yet, sometimes you don't realize that that which you desire on the outside is what you are in the inside. That's why even for those who lust after women or men, you cannot lust out on the outward without also lasting of the inner one, the one who is inside. So when you lust on the outward appearance, you cannot take what is outside and leave the one inside. That's why the Lord says, whoever lusts after a young woman, they've already committed adultery with them in their hearts. You cannot choose to take only the outside and not the inside. The one who is the inner being. Many are being led astray. They are deceived. As a result, they find themselves naked. They are exposing their shameful nakedness. You see them, when they stand up, they are like clothed. They are clothed. Physically, yes. Yet they are naked. For it is better to be naked in the physical than to be naked spiritually. It is better to be a destitute physically than to be a destitute spiritually. We would want to unravel the mystery, the deeper mysteries of God, so that we may have a full understanding of who God is and how he relates with his 
children. And as we progress with the word, we will touch on certain aspects that will give you a good understanding of what it is that God desires of us. That we be able to relate well with him. Tell your neighbor, do not be found, not be found. Naked. naked. Tell them again, do not be found, not be found. Naked. naked. One who is a friend of the world is naked in the sight of God. For sin itself uncovers our nakedness. Sin exposes our nakedness, our shameful nakedness in the sight of God. For it is only when we clothe, clothe ourselves with Christ that we be those covered from that shameful nakedness. For we all know that even to walk naked in this physical world that we are in, it is a shame. Look around yourself and see who is naked here physically. Even those who are in sin, whose minds may not be functioning well, they may be scantily dressed, but yet they will try to cover themselves. It is a shame to appear publicly naked. Yet many, they think they are clothed, yet they are naked. Many do not realize, like when you read, uh, you know, the book of Genesis. You know, like Genesis, let's just us find out. Genesis 3. What was God talking about? Like when he said, well, I think if you read like from Genesis 2, when he says, if you eat that, uh, if, if you eat fruit from the tree of knowledge, of knowing evil and good, you shall surely die. He never said you shall surely be naked. He didn't say you'll be naked. He said you shall surely what? Die. He never said you, you will be naked. Did you say so? Eh? He said you will surely die. And when they ate, that fruit of knowing good and evil. Adam enticed by his wife Eve. They realized they were naked. And when the Lord came walking in the garden. He called them. But when Adam responded he said. We had you in the garden and we hid. Because we are naked. And the Lord said, who told you that you are naked? Did you eat of the fruit that I commanded you not to? When you read towards the end of Genesis 3, you will hear, I think it should be verse 23, where the Lord says, then he banished them from the garden of Eden. 
to go and till the land from which they had been taken. What is he saying? Because to many, the Garden of Eden was physical. Yet the Bible says, he banished them from the Garden of Eden to go and till the land from which they had been taken. What is man tilling today? Is it the Garden of Eden or from where? From the dust. Which garden was God talking about? And what nakedness was he talking about? When they were clothed, why could they not see that they didn't have clothes? When he disobeyed Adam, they saw they were naked. But before, why could they not see? Eh? And which garden were they tilling? I said, we want just to unravel some of the mysteries. Myth. Because we hear so many places about this fruit and all. If the garden of Eden was where men had been taken from, why would God banish him from that garden and send him to go and till the land from which he had been taken? Isn't God took uh, you know, the dust of the earth and he formed what? Man. He formed and breathed and man became a living soul. Eh? He banished them from the Garden of Eden and sent them to go and till the land from which they had been taken. Were there two different lands? Eh? Were there two earths? Earths, E-A-R-T-H-S. Then if you get the answer there, you will then be able to know the kind of fruit trees the Lord was talking about. Whether the fruit trees were those that grow from this dust. If God said, cast be the ground, and if the Garden of Eden was part of the ground, who did not then therefore mean even the Garden of Eden was also cursed. Eh? Where is God hiding this uh, earth? Because I mean, okay, yeah. is it under the sea? Is it in the forest? Where is he hiding the Garden of Eden? If it's part of this expanse, this soil, and God said, cursed be the ground, eh? Where Adam was going to toil with his what? Tilling the land. So if the Garden of Eden was also part of it, would it then, then therefore not have been cursed together with the other land that was cursed? Eh? To produce thorns and thistles. Eh? If these two, the couple, this couple, before they could not see that they were naked, it means they were clothed. They were clothed. They were they were putting on clothes, but not clothes of this world. When they sinned, they could descend. In other words, when they fell they became conscious of the world. And therefore, they required physical clothes. 
they required physical clothes to cover their being. And they then required also physical fruit, fruit trees. Fruit trees. When they were banished from the Garden of Eden, they also became blind to that which gives life. Hmm? So which fruits are they, was the Lord talking about? Was it a mango tree? Was it a peach? Guava? Avocado? What kind of tree? What were those fruit trees in the Garden of Eden? What were they? We hear for the animals, God... He created them, yes. But for the Garden of Eden, were they, was it there in the physical where you can touch it, you can do all, all things? Were those the fruits that the Lord was talking about? If it were so, why then would God differentiate to say, he banished them from the Garden of Eden and send them to till the land from which they had been taken. It tells you that God was not talking of the physical fruits that we relate to. He was talking of spiritual realities. And even when, as we seek to learn who God is, you'll find that when God had finished with men and made them a much stronger, you know, much stronger clothes out of leather, having given the first sacrifice, you don't hear anywhere else where you hear that God came in the middle of the day to fellowship with Adam and Eve. You don't get such engagement anywhere else. For when men sins, they seek to cover up. Just like Adam and Eve, they sought to cover up by leaves. Yet even your cover, nothing is hidden before God. Nothing is hidden before God. You can light yourself, light fellow man, yet God sees everything. Unless our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus, we will never enjoy life in the Lord. So Adam and Eve, they were found naked. They were naked. Yet question is, were they not naked before? When God created them, nowhere did we see or hear him training on tailor, tailoring how to make clothes. Nowhere. Nowhere do we hear that God he had sought to say, look, you can also make clothes out of this fabric or anything of the sort. No way. Or kill this animal. No way. Even up until then, you'd find that he had not been given animals as food. But he had been given fruits in the Garden of Eden. So question is, why would they not have seen that they were naked? Yesterday you saw what uh, the little boy did here. Eh? 
Was he not seeing all of you? Eh? Was he not? He was seeing us, isn't he? Take a little baby. A little baby. Do you have a baby who is nursing? Can you, can you bring baby here? Can you take off the dress for that child? Eh? Eh? <laughs> eh? Is the baby putting on dress? Eh? Eh? But uh, has the baby changed? Is she looking to her? Where is my dress? <laughs> eh? Is she conscious of the dress? No. Eh? She is not conscious of the dress. Eh? If she was, it means she would have been looking for the dress, isn't it? Eh? I, are we together here? This baby, was she putting on a dress before? But now, eh? Does she see that she's naked? No. Eh? No. Does she see? What does it tell you about Adam and Eve? She's innocent, isn't it? In her innocence, is she seeing her nakedness? Eh? Is she ashamed? She's not ashamed, but she's naked. Eh? Is she aware that she's naked? No. Eh? No. But she's naked. No. Okay, thank you. Adam and Eve, they started to know the wrong things. For when they disobeyed God. They became aware and more conscious of the world. And in the world, you need clothing to cover your nakedness of the body. In the world, you need a covering. For your body, for your body, you need clothes. In other words, Adam and Eve, they awakened to the world. Before, they were like dead to the world. Before they ate, they were dead to the world. And therefore separated from the world. But when they disobeyed God, they awakened to the world. Their sense of knowledge, in other words, their senses awakened. Their senses awakened. They became more conscious of the world around them. They started to walk according to sense knowledge. They broke the connection that they had with God for the training that they were going through. There was a reason why God would come to them and fellowship with them in the Garden of Eden. How else would they have had God walking in the Garden if they were not in the spiritual realm? How else? Unless there were those who had stepped into the spiritual realm and walking in it, how else could they relate with God to hear him walking in the garden. Yeah. 
God sought fellowship in order to train them in the way of the Lord. But because they sinned, they were found naked. For one who is sinful is naked before God. For they are exposing their shameful nakedness. Eh? Confused. Eh? Who is confused? Who is not confused? <laughs> eh? Who is not confused? Yeah, is this clear to you? It tells you that the fruit trees were not physical. No. For the Garden of Eden, it's not something where you say, ah, there was an apple tree, like others would want to say, an apple tree that uh, they had to eat. How can you get an apple tree and get wisdom? Are you therefore not like uh, the, uh, the magicians of this world? Before their fall, Adam and Eve were in the spiritual realm, relating with God in the spiritual realm. Then they fell. And when they fell, remember, this is the first couple. When they fell, that's when their sense, knowledge, truth awakened. And they saw, ah, hey, naked. They realized that they were, they were naked. What makes you know that you are naked? Eh? Your eyes, isn't it? Eh? And your eyes register some, something in the mind. Eh? It registers that uh, you are naked, isn't it? Eh? When you see, And you see, ah, naked. Suppose one were to be colored with clothes and you see them from afar off, would you say they are not clothed? Eh? If they are painted. <laughs> <laughs> eh? You may mistake them to be what? To be clothed, isn't it? Because of sight. When you walk by sight, you want to prove that eh, it is there. God calls things which be not as if they are. If it's God who calls things which be not as if they are, it means when you are in the Lord and you are of faith and walking by faith, I mean then, not, not now, you know, because now, I mean, the corruption came into the world. But you see, what it means is, at the time, they were clothed by clothes that humans, human beings of this world could not see. Those of sight could not see the clothes, yet themselves could see the clothes, themselves could see the fruits. How else could Haggai see a well which she couldn't see before, which was very close by, and she was crying? Until the angel said, why are you crying unto me? Take the shed, take some water, you know, get the water and drink. She was crying for water, you remember? Eh? She was crying for water. Something which was there, but she could not see. But she could not what? See. How else 
could Elijah be fed by an angel at the brook? And he went for 40 days and 40 nights without eating anything. The challenge is we are so used to just these clothes. Huh? Let's suppose we are all walking, you know, like those who are in the spiritual realm, it's like you are just like visions that you are seeing. If you see one, who, you know, like, you know, the vision giving you that they are putting on nice clothes, would you say they are not clothed? What it means, you are blinded to what? To the world, but you, your sight has been opened to the spiritual realm. Blind to the world, yet having sight to the things of God. Eh? Confused? Are you getting a bit of it? Eh? Ah, yeah. mm. 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 Eh? Where did you think the Garden of Eden was? Where? Where did you think it was? Where? <laughs> Where did you think it was? Somewhere in Israel. Somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> or somewhere. So others are, are going there hoping that they may stumble on Garden of Eden. <laughs> eh? Interesting. And this guy, you know, when you read the word, this Garden of Eden also, you, you remember, this earth is going to pass away. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And there there will be the Garden of what? Eh? There will be the garden of what? Eden in there. In the new earth and the new what? Heavens. There will be the garden of what? Eden. Not in this old order. In this old dispensation. Not in this earth. Which was cursed. Uh-uh. <laughs> and if you read through what it means for those who have come to know the Lord they, have, they are enjoying the fruits that the Lord would require of them that's why even as you read Revelations I think you can check the chapter there can't remember which one but you see where we are told that there will be the tree of life. Which will be found what? In paradise. The tree of life will be there. But no mention of the other fruits. The other fruit trees. Eh? Are, are we together? Eh? Hey, this one is difficult. Okay. Hey. Okay, let's just read so that we, we know what we are saying. Okay, Genesis. Let's just read. Let's read uh, Genesis 2 from verse 8. Now I'll read. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Let's read on. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into for head, head, head waters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of 
of Awi Awila where where there is gold, the gold of that land is good, aromatic, resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gion. It winds through the entire land of Kush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It, these rivers are there. Eh? So you can go and look for the Eden there. Eh? You can go and look for it. Eh? Ask those who have done geography eh, to go, you know, archaeologists, go and dig it. Okay, he says. Resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gion. The name of that Tigris, it runs along the east side of Asha. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Okay. Let's go to chapter 3. Right, let's read uh, from verse 17. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. Hmm? It says, cursed is the ground because of you. Cursed is what? The ground. Which ground? This one. Eh? This is the ground cursed. Is that not the case? Eh? So if uh, we say cursed be the ground, where you are seated is it not cursed. Is it not part of the ground? Eh? Okay, let's read on. It says, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Let's go to verse... Um, Let's now go to, the, okay, let's just move on. It says, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not al be allowed to, to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden. From the garden of what? Eden. He banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Which ground? Was Eden not, not on the ground from which he was taken? Eh? Which ground was he taken from? You have got gardens. Look at look around. There's a, you know that's garden there, that's garden there, isn't it? Is the garden not part of this ground? Eh? So where was it then? Then. So where was it? Then he says. After he drove the men out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim. And a flaming sword. Cherubim and, fl and a flaming sword. Cherubim, is it a physical being or a spiritual being? Eh? And, so, and a flaming sword, flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This one, is it found by those who walk by sight? Eh? But by those who what? 
Walk by faith. This garden of Eden was for those whose spiritual eyes had been opened. Those who are relating with God in the spiritual. Was it physical, this garden of Eden? Were they not naked in the physical? I mean, in the worldly sense, were they not naked before? Eh? They were naked, but were they conscious of their nakedness? Why? Because they, are, they were clothed. Those who are right in the sight of God, they have got different clothes than what you see. This one that you see, we are putting on to cover our body's nakedness. The nakedness of our body in the physical. Yet we have got garments. Garments of righteousness. We should put on from the inside. The inner being. Uh, eh? it, this is why Paul, when we read 2 Corinthians 5 from verse 1, where he says, when this body is destroyed, when our earthly tent is destroyed, we have got a heavenly house. We have got a heavenly house. For we know that he, when it's destroyed, we will be given a heavenly house to cover our nakedness so that we don't continue to be naked. So we don't continue to be naked. This is an earthly tent. For he says, as long as we are in this tent, we know we are away from the Lord. But when this tent is destroyed, when the mortal is put on the heavenly house, when it's covered by the heavenly house, we will be where the Lord is. So we are groaning for the heavenly house. Whilst we are in this body, we groan. In order for us to be covered by our heavenly house, the heavenly tent. And God has given us his spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing that which we are to receive. For we walk by faith and not by sight. And we know that we are covered by our works of righteousness. We are clothed by our works of righteousness, by that garment of righteousness. That's what Christians might be putting on, not clothes that you put on in the physical. You may look smart, yet you are naked. Okay, let's read 2 Corinthians 5 from verse 1. I'll read from verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. We will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. 
We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before judgment seat, before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Says, when we are clothed, then we will not remain naked. Is he talking of physical nakedness? The reason why you see the nakedness of other people's physical being is because you are alive to the world and blind to truth. Those who are alive to the world, they will see their nakedness as a result. They are always seeing their lack in their lives. They are never content in whatever circumstance they find themselves in. You saw the small baby there. The baby was content, whether with the clothes on or no clothes. She was oblivious of her surroundings, other than the security that she had in the arms of her mother. If the mother were to put her down and leave, that's when you might find her crying. Not about clothes. Not what she was putting on. That's why today you find many, they are frantically looking for the world. They desire the world more they, than they desire God. They desire the world more than they desire the word of God. Better for one to be clothed in the spirit than it is for them to be clothed in the physical. Those whose eyes of the heart have been enlightened, they see what God has put on them. For when Adam and Eve sinned, they took off the robe that God had clothed them in. And as a result, they were looking for that which they can put on in the physical. They became blind to the spiritual realities. For that which is spiritual is more real than that which is temporary. So now they were looking to that which they can cover, use their body to cover. Because they had been awakened to the world. They became alive to the world. Those who are dead to the world are alive to the spiritual truth, the spiritual reality in Christ Jesus. When the Lord was resurrected, we heard that he left his clothes in the tomb. Yet for many days he was seen by his disciples. He even came in their midst. He came and he ate with them. He ate, they said, hey, is a ghost? And say, I mean, can a ghost eat food? He ate. Remember, they saw him by the seashore when Peter and them had gone back fishing and he was roasting some fish. Was he naked? When they saw him go up as he ascended, was he naked? Yet the clothes that he had 
when he was buried, were they not in the tomb? So what was he putting on? What was he putting on? Even the fish that he was roasting, we had no way where he went into the sea to fish. Yet when he called them from where they were fishing, say, hey, come, let's come, eat. He was already roasting. Where did the fish come from? Is anything too hard for God? If the Garden of Eden remained on the ground that was cursed, then does it mean it was all cursed? Eh? It's a garden preserved, preserved for those who are the chosen. Tell anybody, do not be found, do not be found. Naked. naked. For when you read Ezekiel 16, you can read from verse 1, where he said, This is the word of the Lord, declare it unto Jerusalem, to the children of Israel. He says, well, your ancestors not of the Canaanites, were well, they not in Canaan? Your mother and your father, were well, they not of the Amorites and Hittites? He said, yet when you were born, they did not cut the umbilical cord. You were languishing in blood, filthy. But when I saw you, he says, I said, leave. And then you blossomed when you got life. You grew into maturity. And when you had come to a point where you would be accountable, when you mature, to be able to know how to love, he says, I covered you with my garment. I covered you, I covered your nakedness with my garment. And I made a covenant with you. It says, I cleaned you of the blood that was on you and gave you a raiment or a garment of embroidery and jewelry. I put them on you. He said, I covered your nakedness. He was talking to a nation. For many even like if you read the same chapter, like I think from verse 35 there, where it says your prostitution, where you lead men astray, he has, he has exposed your nakedness. It has exposed your nakedness. Sexual immorality. That's why even as you read Genesis 42 from verse, I think, 9 thereabout, where Joseph says to the brothers, as they were trying to justify why they were in the land of Egypt, for he had said, you have come, you have come to spy on the nakedness of the land. The nakedness of what? The land. So when you hear God talking about your nakedness, one who has sinned is naked in his sight. Their shameful nakedness is exposed. Even as it is a shame to walk naked, who has ever walked into the street naked? Raise up your hand. <laughs> but these babies can walk. Eh? Do you think that baby would care? Eh? What causes them to walk? Do they care for clothes? Is it something that they think of? 
Who provides the clothes? The mother, isn't it? So Adam and Eve were in an era where God was providing for them until he fell. Until he fell. If it were not for Adam and Eve, we would not even have gone into this fashion thing which has caused many to go astray. Was there fashion at the time of Adam and Eve before their fall? Fashion started. Because then they will compare what God made for them, you know, of uh, you know, animal skin, and uh, what they prepared. They say, ah, this is better. And fashion started. There will not be any. There will not be any if God were to be our sufficiency, providing everything. It means God had provided them clothing. Just like the little baby. That little baby never provided herself with clothing. That's why she never cared what she's putting on. But when you are one who provides for yourself, you care what you're putting on. You will care what you are putting on. That's why many, they care so much how they look on the outside. They care so much. Yet God is covered in splendor and majesty. He clothes himself in light. He clothes himself in light. Psalm 104. Okay, let's read it. From verse 1. Praise the Lord, my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the, the beams of his of his upper chambers on the on their waters. So when God is your sufficient, you are not one who would look to provide for your own. Because when Adam and Eve fell, they ceased to depend upon God. As a result, they made a plan. Made clothes out of leaves. They made a plan. Yet their plan was futile. It could not adequately cover them. Imagine leaves. Soon they dry up. Sin will cause you to be ashamed even when you are hiding in secret. For your heart will, will convict you. Your conscience will tell you. Even when you are in your house, when you commit sin, you not hide from it. There were only two, yet they were ashamed. Was there anyone besides Adam and Eve? Eh? Yet they were ashamed. Ashamed of who? You husband and wife, have you not uh, walked in your house there? Eh? Eh? Husband, are you ashamed of wife? And wife, are you ashamed of uh, husband? Eh? So what were they ashamed of? Sin will cause you to be ashamed, for then you are naked in the sight of God. For it is only when your sins have been taken off, when you've been forgiven. That's why when you read like Zechariah, Zechariah 3 from verse 1. I know many there, they're a bit confused there as well. Where we are told, the man Joshua, he came before the presence of God. And Satan stood by his right hand side, accusing him. He was accusing him. 
trying to block him. But the Lord rebuked Satan and said, can you not see that this man is like a, a stick plugged from the fire? And he told the angels who were there to remove the filth garment that was on him and to put on him a clean garment. For Joshua was the high priest and says, if you obey me in the midst of your other people, then I'll make you to be judge over my people, to judge over them. And he says, see, I set a stone before Joshua and it will have seven eyes. It will be a branch. And on that day, I will take away the sins of man. And that was a sign of things to come. Okay, let's read it. Zachariah. Was others are confused. Is it Jesus? Is it? Who was, who was this Joshua? Eh? Remember, this is a shadow of things to come. I'll read from verse 1. He says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord, who has, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is that, is not this, Men, a burning stick, snatched from the fire. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off this filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin. Eh? I've taken away what? Your sin. The filthy garment was what? Sin. And I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, put a clean, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me, and keep my requirements. Then you will govern my house. And have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place among these standing here. If it were Jesus Christ, why would it be the angel of the Lord talking to him? When is the very one that we are told that no one has ever known God. But he was in the bosom of the father. He was in the bosom of the father. So if God wanted to communicate with his son, would he send an angel? Eh? Would he not speak direct? Okay, let's read one. He says, Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you who are men who are men symbolic of things to come. Who are men what? Symbolic of things to come. Eh? Okay, let's read on. It says, I am going to bring my servant, the branch. Who? Jesus. The branch. He is the branch, isn't it? A shoot out of the stem of Jesse. A branch out of his roots who would bear fruit. He's the branch, isn't it? Eh? You remember, it's what? Isaiah 11, isn't it? From verse 1. Okay. He says, See, 
The stone I have set in front of Joshua, there are seven eyes. Listen, I priest Joshua, you and your ancestors, seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant, the branch. See, the stone I have set in front of Joshua, there are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription, an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. In that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. So this was symbolic. It was not Jesus, it was Joshua, but it was what? Symbolic of things to come. Huh? No, we said we wanted just to you know, unravel some of the mysteries. Joshua was putting on a filthy garment which needed to be taken off. When it was taken off, his sins were also taken away. And he was clothed with clean linen. With clean what? Linen. That's why even as you read Zechariah 13 from verse 1, where the Lord says, in that day there will be a fountain. A fountain for the house of David and, and for Jerusalem. To purify them from sin and all idols. You'll banish every name of all idols. They'll be banished from the midst of the children of Israel. They'll be made pure. Purity not of body but of heart. For when God talks of the nakedness, he's talking of our inner being, our spirit, our heart. This is what God examines, not the outward appearance. Men who are merely human, they judge by outward appearance. The body, are you clothed? But that's what they see. But a mere child in their innocence, they will not see their nakedness before men. They will not see their nakedness before men. Yet those who are alive to the world, their focus is worldly things. I'm lacking this. I'm like that's why there's so much jealousy, so much envy. That's why David says, I almost slipped from my secure position. He almost, that's what he says. Okay, let's read Psalm. Psalm 73. Hey, we want to open them so that you know they are there. Okay, I'll read from verse 1. He says, Surely God is, is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had, I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people, tend to, their people tend to them and drink up waters in abundance. They tend to them for money. 
That's a gospel of prosperity. That's where what he said. There are people tend to them and drink water in abundance. That's what he said. He says, they say, how would God know? Does the most I know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been afflicted and every morning brings new punishment. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they, are they destroyed? Completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakens. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was brute. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by your right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will make me into glory. Afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth is nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You can read on it on. It on. Hmm. He almost slipped when he focused on the world. Like many are falling when they focus on the world. They start to see their nakedness. They start to see their nakedness. Many. Does that include you? Tell your neighbor again, do not be found, not be found. Naked. naked. Many. That's why when we read the word, like in Revelations, where the Lord says, this is what you must say to the church of Laodicea. Listen to these words. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful one. The whole one of Israel. It says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. You are lukewarm, and therefore I will spit you out. You say I have everything. I do not need anything because I've got it all. I am rich. Yet you are poor, you are wretched, pitiful, blind, and naked. It says, Come and buy from me gold refined in fire, that you be rich. Buy clothes from me that you be clothed and be covered from your shameful nakedness. And get sal for your eyes that you be able to see, to see right. It is only when we are clothed by God himself that we be covered from our nakedness. That we be covered. Okay, let's read Revelation 3. Let's 
Let's read first Revelation 3 from verse 1. I'll read. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the key, who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Hey. Hey. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. A reputation of being a Christian, yet you are an infidel. Eh? How many have got a reputation of being Christians? The majority. Go the whole world, you'll see. Millions in churches today, yet how many worship God in the spirit and truth? Very few. Very few. Even here. You must test yourself to see, examine yourself to see where you stand. You must constantly examine yourself lest you be found naked on that day. For those who will be naked will not go. You are going to leave these clothes that you are putting on. Talk about Elijah. Did he go with those, his clothes? He left the cloak, isn't it? That's what Elijah took. But did Elijah saw nakedness of Elijah and say, my father, you are naked. Did he say so? Because he was clothed. He was what? Clothed. Okay. He says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. You are being reminded. Strengthen that which is still there, which is about to die. Strengthen it. That which still remains. Eh? That's what the Lord is saying. What he tells you is, Falling from grace is progressive. It's not an event. The hardening of the heart is progressive. You don't just wake up with a hardened heart. It comes slowly but surely. If you are led to the schemes of Satan, you say, no, I'm for God. When you are enticed by your evil desires, it doesn't just come all of a sudden, too. It's progressive, progressive, until you have crossed over into darkness. Once you are there, it will be very difficult for you to come back. That's why the Lord says, do not let the sun go down on you whilst you are angry. You know, Ephesians 4 from verse 26. Don't let it go down. In other words, he's saying anger springs from unforgiveness and every other bad thing. When you fail to forgive, you are angry, obviously. The result is what is anger. Don't be angry. And don't let the sun go down on you being angry. Lest you give Satan a crevice into your life. Okay, let's read on. He says, Remember, therefore, what you have received and had, hold, hold it fast. Family, hold on to it. What you have received and had, hold it fast, the word. And repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will, work, they, they will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. Eh, it's not the garment that you see by the roadsides. Dressed in white. <laughs> eh? It's not about what you put on in the physical. 
Because many think when they put on white, then they are more religious, more righteous. No. The Lord says here, he says, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. Which clothes? Not clothes in the physical. But the garments of righteousness. Not clothes in the physical. Say, they will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Are you hearing? You see, this is interesting. When he started, he says, to the angel of the church in Sardis, when he concluded, he says, let them hear what the Spirit, he says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, not to the church. Eh? Let's read again uh, verse 14 there. It says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I cancel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can, be, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your your eyes so you can see. Mm. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them, with that person, and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You will put on white remnants, Because you'll be found worthy in the sight of God. We will walk with him if we be properly clothed, properly dressed. Unless we be those who walk in obedience, in the way of the Lord, we are found naked in his sight. For it is through the good acts in obedience to the word of God, that we find ourselves clothed. For love, which is self, our acts of obedience to the word, covers a multitude of sins. Read 1 Peter 4. From verse 8. Read also Proverbs 10 from verse 12. Hatred tears conflict. But love covers a multitude of sins. So when you act in love, 
not the love of men, but love of God. For we can only love men through God. Not where you say to your husband, I love you with all my heart. Uh, you know, and your wife, I love you with all my heart. You will be a, you're a fool if you are like that. Your heart is a preserve for God, not for men. If we are to love men, we must love them with the love of God. By acting the word. Directing our good deeds in obedience to the word towards our fellow men. Not where you are just saying, I love you. And most, most, of, most of it be lustful love. Not love of the heart. So if we are to be those who are to put on the right garments, we must be found to be those who walk in obedience to the word of God. We must be found to be putting on the right garments. The right garments. Knowing that salvation itself belongs to our God and to Jesus Christ, the, the Son. We ought to praise God, to give him glory, honor, and all majesty. For all strength and might belongs to him. He is the one who, clothes, who gives us clothes to put on. The white raiments, the garments of righteousness. That we'll be able to stand before his presence. These were the same clean linen that was given to the elders. We're crying before God. For how long, Lord, will we wait for justice? But the Lord gave them clothes, clean linen, white garments. And says, this will not happen until your fellow brothers, who are yet to be killed as you are killed, you have been killed on earth. Only then will, be ju will justice be meted out. The nakedness that the Lord talks of is not in the physical. It's not in the physical. It is the spiritual nakedness. Let's just read more in Revelations. Let's just read from verse, um, chapter 6, from verse 9. I'll read. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been killed. I watched as he opened, okay, there you can read later on. It says, then each of them was given a white robe, a white robe, a white robe. They were given a white robe by God. Okay, let's read, let's go on to chapter 7 there. Let's read uh, verse 9 as well. It says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could number or count, from every nation, 
tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the lamp, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, say, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Eh. They'd washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They'd cleaned them. Meaning, we are cleansed when we are forgiven from our sins. When our sins are forgiven. And only those who walk in the way of obedience. Even as the Lord says, when you read... John 14, you can read from, from verse 15, where he says, if you love me, keep my word, and I'll pray the Father, and will give you another comforter, who will teach you of all things, and bring to remembrance all that I've taught you. He says, the world cannot see him, and therefore cannot receive them, but you see him. And he is with you, and he will be in you. Says he will be in you. Says if you love me, my father will love you. And I'll come and manifest myself in you. I'll manifest myself to those who love me. That's what the Lord says. And Judas, not his God, was asked. Says why do you manifest yourself to us only and not to them? And says, those who love me will keep my word. But those who don't love me, they cannot obey my word. So if you love me, my father will love you. And will come and make our abode in you, our dwelling place in you. In that day you will know that I'm in the father. And that you are in me and I in, in you. If we obey God, if we are obedient, if we walk by faith and not by sight, if we walk by faith and not by sight, those who walk by faith are those who are found to walk in the way of obedience, obedient to the word of God, obedient to the word of God. They are obedient to the word of God. For we are told that the Lord will blow over the Ophrys river and he will dry it up to prepare for the kings from the east. And there will be a spirit that will come out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. A spirit that looks like a frog. That will cause men to perform signs which will deceive many in preparation for that great war. The battle of Armageddon. But the Lord said, blessed are those who will keep watching. For I come like a thief. He says, I will come like a thief. You will never know when he comes. But blessed are those who keep watching. And remain clothed so that they will not go 
with their nakedness exposed, lest they be put to shame. For you cannot go if your nakedness is exposed. Okay, let's read it. Revelation 16. Let's read from verse uh, 12. It says, The sixth angel poured out his bowel on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way. To prepare the way for the kings of the east, from the east. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the, for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who, s who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Be shamefully what? Exposed. Why do you need to be clothed? Unless you are properly dressed at that wedding banquet, you'll be thrown out. Read Matthew 22 from verse 1. Where there was a king who sent out his servants and said, go and gather all those who have been invited for the wedding for, for his son. He says, go and tell them that everything is ready. I've slaughtered my fat and calves and all. We are ready for the celebration. Yet, none of those invited came. For they gave excuses. Some said, I need to take care of my business. I need to go to the fields. Uh, so many excuses. So they could not come. He sent them again, his servants, to say, hey, the, banquet, the banquet is ready. Come celebrate with me at the wedding of my son. But they took the servants and killed them. So the king was enraged. He sent out his soldiers and destroyed the city of those murderers. And he sent his servants. He said, just go and gather those who are in the street, the good and the bad. Bring them in to celebrate with me. So they went out and gathered everyone, bad and good alike. And they all filled the room. So when the king came in their midst, he saw one man who was not properly dressed for the, week, for the wedding. He said, my friend, why is it that you are not dressed for the wedding? And he told those who were in there to bind them, both hands and legs, and cast them where there is gnashing, weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. We may be here, all of us, yet we may be not be putting on the right clothes in order for us to be chosen. It is only those who ready themselves by adorning on their wedding garment for the coming of the bridegroom who will be chosen. For such garments are our righteous acts. When we seek to do the word and not just to be hearers only, doers of the word, doers of the word, Let's read Revelations again.
Let's read from verse. Um, let's read from verse. Let's read from verse five. You can read that one. That one time. I'll read. Then a voice came from the throne saying, "Praise God, all you his servants, you who fear Him, both great and small." Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad, and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Fine linen, it stands for our righteous acts. Unless you be a doer of the word, you are naked. We are not called to be hearers only, but to be doers of the word. For in doing the word, we act love towards our fellow man, and love covers a multitude of sins. Unless your sins are forgiven, you are naked. You remain naked and therefore exposing your shameful nakedness before God. It is only when we are found to be walking in the way of obedience, obedience to the word of God, to be doers of the word, for unless you be a doer of the word, you are merely one who is claiming to be one, yet you are not. That's why the Lord said, these people, they serve me with their lips, yet their hearts are far from me. Our obedience must flow from the heart. We must obey God from the heart. And we obey him by doing the word, by acting upon the word. It is only when we return to God with a repentant heart, not being as those who are arrogant, putting our hope in the worldly wealth, but we must put our hope in the Lord, who richly provides us with every good thing for our enjoyment. Storing up treasure in heaven for the age to come. That you may hold on to life that is really life. You know, 1 Timothy 6 from verse 17. That's what Timothy was told, to command those who are rich in this world. Not to be arrogant or to trust in their own wealth. Not to put their hope in the worldly things. For when you read, look, Luke 12 from verse 18, when that man, there was a man, when the Lord was teaching, he shouted and said, Lord, make my brother to share the inheritance with me. But the Lord says, my friend, who has appointed me a bitter between you two, says you must be careful, for the riches of men is not in the abundance of their possession. He said there was a rich young man whose land yielded much, and he said, now let me destroy these bands and build bigger ones so that I can store up treasure for myself. Then when I fill them up, I'll say, my soul, you can now sit back and relax and enjoy that you have, which you have set aside. But say, the Lord says, in the very night, the Lord said to him, your very soul is required of you. So now let's see who is going to enjoy all that you have set apart for yourself. Say, so shall it be for those 
who store up treasure for themselves and not reach unto God, who are not rich towards God. Those who are not rich towards God are naked. They cannot obey God. They cannot do the word. They are naked. They expose their shameful nakedness before God. If you read Matthew 16, Matthew 19 from verse 16, there was a rich young man who approached the Lord and said, what can I do to inherit the kingdom of God? But the Lord go and do the law. He says, I've done everything. I've followed the commandments. Since I was young, I did everything. But the Lord says, yes, you have done. But this one thing you must do so that you may be perfect. Go sell everything that you have and give to the poor. Now come, follow me. Then you will inherit the kingdom of God. But the young man looked at what he had and said, ah, no, he was sad. He looked back and turned back and started to walk back away from the Lord. And the Lord said, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. How hard it is. It is easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples said, so who's going to be saved? The Lord said, it is, it's what is impossible with man is possible with God. Many, they would want to cling to worldly things rather than to attain unto perfection that the Lord desires all because of pride, pride of life, lust of the eyes, and last of the flesh. All they do is, if they are to act upon the word, it's all for the wrong motives. It's all for the wrong motives. Here the Bible says, if you be poor, don't worry. Take pride in your exalted position. And those who are rich, they must humble themselves for they are going to be humbled because of their lowly positions because their riches are going to fly away. Even as the sun rises and with us the flowers that blossoms, so also shall be their riches. Here today, tomorrow gone. Read James 1 from verse 9. So if we be those who walk according to the ways of God, we will remain clothed on that day so that we will not go naked and be ashamed of the exposed nakedness of ours. Those who will be naked on that day will not go. Unless you be clothed from on high, you cannot come into his presence. You cannot come into his presence. Celebration is for those who are properly dressed. Tell your neighbor, celebration is for those who are properly dressed. Not the dressing of this world, but you must be dressed by our Father. We must be dressed by our Father. For as long as you seek to dress yourself by your own good works, you will remain trying to rely upon yourself. But if you be dependent upon God, your reliance will be on God and not on man. You must put your reliance on God. And only those who realize that God is the only living God, great and marvelous are his days. Apart from him, there is no other God. Those who have learned his ways, can rely on his faithfulness. Those who have been given an undivided heart may fear him. For they will praise him and honor him with all their heart. You know, Psalms 86 from verse 10. They will praise God in all that they do. In their thoughts, word, and deed. They will seek to please God in all that they do. They will not fall for certain schemes that destitute 
How can you be fooled by destitute? Even in the physical, they tell you, hey, I'll give you money. Where do they get the money from? When you look at yourself, you're better off. Look at the cartoon that they're they are carrying. How can you entrust your soul to a destitute? How? Is it not foolishness? We, well, we have seen also, well, you know, not uh, in a derogatory manner, but we have seen our fellow brothers and sisters who are destitute in this earth. Have we not? And you see what they'll be carrying on them. A desperate situation which requires us to act. But nonetheless, can they really convince you that they can make you a millionaire? Eh? Yet many are deceived by the foolish one. They are told, just bow to me and I'll make you a millionaire. Before you know it, they are bowing. Hey, please make me a millionaire. Such millions will not last. They only come to fly away. For such rising can only be to come down. You must put on clothes to cover your nakedness. Not just clothes, but clothes that are lasting. So that when he comes, as he says, I'll come like a thief. You will not be found exposing your shameful nakedness. Only when we do right, when we walk in the way of holiness, doing that which is right before the Lord, are we found clothed with the right clothes. You must be ready for the wedding. Prepare yourself in readiness as a bride waiting for his bridegroom. Unless we be properly adorned, when the bridegroom comes, he is looking to those who remain awake, not those foolish five of the ten virgins whose lamps were found without oil. They exhausted all that they had. That's why the Lord says, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? You know, when we read Luke 18 from verse 1, you know, the persevering widow who went to the king and said, please, make justice between me and my enemies. The king wanted to ignore her, but she persisted until she got what she wanted. And the Lord says, if the unjust judge, king could do so, how much more your father? But he says, when I come into the earth, will I find faith in the earth? For the love of many has grown cold, yet faith must be expressed through love. Unless we walk in the way of love, our faith is dead. And therefore, we remain blind. We cannot see far. It is only those who walk in the way of love, producing the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, Faithfulness, gentleness, long suffering. Only those can see far because they do realize that they themselves were also forgiven of their sins. And therefore, they will forgive all who sin against them. Tell your neighbor, do not be found not be naked. Many are naked. It is about time that you put on the right clothes. Not the adorning of the outward nature, but the adorning of the inner being. Tell your neighbor, not the adorning, not the adorning of, the 
of the outward being. The outward nature. But the adorning of the inner being. You see them walking with a step like they are already in heaven. <laughs> Putting on those designer suits and a designer shoe and a gold watch. And they think they've got all. And you admire them. Do you know where they got it, got it from? Do you know where they got those riches from? When you admire, you are also admiring the giver. When you admire the car, you say, hey, this car, very nice. You are admiring the manufacturer. And Satan is the manufacturer of evil. So if they've received that from the devil, you are admiring too. That's why many are in trouble today. They see, hey, my brother, where did you get your shoes from? They don't know where it, go, where it came from. It may have come from the marine world. So when you say, where did you get it from? You are admiring the marine what? And when you admire them, do you think they will stay far? They will come closer. They will come. You must know that that foolish one is very cunning. He has thrown all around monitoring spirits. Each one of us, here, he knows your behavior. He knows your weakness. He never uses what you don't have. What you have is what he uses. He is always, you know, the more your fire grows, the fire around you, the more distant they may be, but they will be, still be monitoring to see. To see. When you look at a woman lustfully, they say, yeah, I think if we, let's send more. Let's send what? More. More. You last for one. Then as you see them more, one day. One day. If you were to talk to fish in the river or in the sea, they will tell you that, hey, I was missed by a hook once. But as long as they continue to eat, as they are fed on the bait, one day. One what day? If you are to take, talk, of, talk to any of the fish which is now taken out of the water, it will tell you how many times it had been missed, how many times it ate successfully, eating the bait. But one day, it was scooped out of the water. One what day? Tell your neighbor one day. One day. Be, careful. Be careful. Just one day. So you must be what? Careful. We must remain clothed in readiness for the wedding banquet as brides waiting for their bridegroom. And we prepare not by the adorning of these stylish clothes, stylish hairs and making up for what you think God left out. Eh? There are men who think God, uh, you forgot something. You forgot that my lipstick must be red, but you gave me brown. You forgot that my hair must be colorful. Red, yellow, brown, so I must put them. I'm not talking of you, my sister. <laughs> it's not you. Uh, yours is not like that. Eh? Yours is black. <laughs> you say what? Eh? Are you sure? Yours is like what? Like brown, like yellow. <laughs> You know, when you look yourself in the mirror, you know, you must be able to say, I was fearfully and wonderfully mad. But, 
but can you say so, my, my sister, with, uh, can you really look at your hair and say, I was fearfully and wonderfully mad? <laughs> eh? Uh, eh? I, I will take this off today after this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you are yourself, you can say that, isn't it? But you see, when you say you are saying from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, wonderfully and fearfully mad. Clothing, yes, because even God Himself He provided for Adam and Eve. We need to be clothed so that we don't appear physically naked. A time will come when we put on, you know, the imperishable. On that day when we are pushed on, when we put on the imperishable, when the immortality put on, when mortality puts on immortality, then we can say, where all death is your victory? Where? Where is your sting? For the power of sin is the law, and the sting of death is sin. But thanks be unto God, who gave us victory through his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 52. So we are looking forward to our heavenly dwelling. Our heavenly dwelling. Our heavenly dwellings. We must put on Jesus Christ. For we are told that we walk in him and we have got our very being in him. We walk in the Lord. And we have got our very being in, in him. You know, Acts 17 from verse 28. It is only those who are properly clothed, who do the works of their father, those who are chosen for good works. For we are recreated in Christ Jesus for good works. For good works. We are God's workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus for good works. For good works. For good works. That's who we are. That's who we are. If you read Ephesians 2 from verse 8. That is who we are. Never allow the deceiver. He uses the world as a bait. Tell your neighbor, never allow never. yourself to be deceived. That deceiver, that destitute, uses the world to deceive many. He uses the world as a bait. We must die to the world and be alive unto Christ. Our focus must be heavenly. Focus on the things above. Set your mind on things above. Set your heart on things above where Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of God the Father. When we focus on the word, prayerfully, attentively, then and only then are we able to focus our mind and our hearts on things above. The word of God points us to the spiritual realities. The word of God points us to the spiritual realities. And those who meditate upon the word of God day and night and confess his word always are those who walk with the Lord, are those who are found to be victorious, are those who will be given that white linen, are those who are found to be worthy for the wedding of the lamp. The wedding of the lamp. Are you looking forward for it? Are you looking forward to it? Then you must be properly clothed. 
Do not let your shameful nakedness be exposed. Be a doer of the word. Delight yourself in the Lord. Walk by faith and not by sight. For those who will be found to be naked will be left behind. Tell your neighbor, those who will be found naked will be left behind. For you'll be too ashamed to go. If one were to be naked here, do you think they'll stand? Let's just suppose, hey, my brother, my brother, you are seated there now. Eh? You are putting on a shirt and let's suppose now, now, yes, just now, you just look down and you see your trousers gone. What would you do? <laughs> and with all these people, what would you do? Yes, you are there now. Eh? But what would you do? Uh, okay, that's some, um, what actually, what would you do? Uh, just now, now, now. You just look and you see, you are naked. Oh, my brother, uh, what would you do? You are seated right here in front. And all of a sudden, all along, we are looking there, but you just, then you say, eh? Uh, eh? Will you uh, stand up? No, I'll remain seated. You will remain what? Seated. Eh? You just remain seated. <laughs> You'll be too ashamed to stand <laughs> You'll be too ashamed to stand up eh? lest he expose himself what more isn't that the case eh? <laughs> You'll just find a way of, uh, eh? This is what will happen on that day. You will not have the boldness to stand. You will not, if you are found what? Naked. <laughs> uh, you know, we may just be talking like we're just, this is exactly what it is. So you must make sure you act upon the word. Delight yourself in the word of God. Be a doer of the word. For in doing the word, we manifest our love for God. And in manifesting our love for God, we show our love for our brothers and sisters. It is in the obedience of the word that we show love for God and our fellow man. Unless you are obedient, no matter how much you claim to love God, you don't love him. If we obey his word from the heart, we show our love for him. Do not be found naked. Those who look to God for their clothes are entirely dependent upon his merits and mediations. Let your reliance upon God's word be entire and absolute. Be fully dependent upon God in this season of establishment. Be entirely dependent upon God's word. And those who depend on him entirely are doers of the word. They cannot do without the word. Such are those that you find forgiving those who sin against them. Never harboring anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, worry, anxiety, and awe. They look to God for their sufficiency. They are content in all circumstances. They are never in despair. No matter what comes their way, they will never run to the world for a solution. But they will draw to God 
they will always run to God for every solution to all challenges of the world. Make sure you are properly dressed on that day. Make sure you are properly dressed today. Don't be like those where God says you have been ties through your prostitution, nations and kingdoms, and your witchcraft. You have enticed many to go astray. You, Nineveh, you know, in Nam, Nam, it should be 3, verse 5. He says, I will cause your dress to be lifted up to your face so that your nakedness may be exposed to many, that you be ashamed of your evil deeds. He says, I will pelt you with, with filth. I will pelt you with filth. You know, uh, let, let's, uh, my sister, if you are walking eh, and suddenly you're, and you're in a crowd, like here, say you are there, there, suddenly the wind just comes, lifts the skirt and the, and the, and the pit coat. <laughs> eh? How, how, how would you feel? I would be shy. You'll be shy. You'll be ashamed. Yes. Eh? Yes. This is what, what God says. For those who don't do right, you'll put them to shame. He says, I'll pelt you with filth and every debt. Don't be one who has God as his enemy. Be a friend of God, not an enemy of God. You cannot stand as an enemy of God and stand. Only the foolish one, that deceiver, that destitute, that homeless, hopeless conman, Satan. Don't allow him to deceive you to take off your clean clothes. May God bless you. May he bless his word.